My name is Eric Jordan. I'm a lifelong commercial salmon troller. I raised my family on the boat. I grew up with my dad and mother and three younger sisters. I'm born into the salmon troll fishery and I absolutely love it. I came here uh, when I had just turned 20, lured up here by loving wild places. Alaska is the ultimate wild place. I spent a month pounding the docks. There was a lot of fishing going on, but nobody was gonna give me a job. And there's still not very many women who work on fishing boats. It's, it's about 12% now, but in those days there were even less. So when people would haul their boats out or when they were shoveling out the fish hold, I would just go over and say, hey, can I help? People watch you work and saw that I would work hard. And then finally, someone offered me a job and I just fell in love with it. What I love most about what I get to do is the absolute freedom and challenge of figuring out every day how to adjust to the realities of the weather, the fish, the dynamics of fishing around other boats. One of the things that impressed me my very first year fishing was listening to fishermen talking to each other about what was going on in the ocean. Us fishermen out here every day are kind of like the canaries in the coal mine. We are seeing stuff that is truly dystopic. And whatever you believe the cause of climate change, there's no denying that it is happening. To see the birds and little fishes just vanishing in some places, it's just frightening. On the other hand, it's not a straight slide down. It's a roller coaster. People see Alaska as a place where there's still a chance to do it right and find that balance between protecting the fish, having local economies that depend on natural resources, but those natural resources are still healthy and productive. With more coastline than every other state combined and over 40% of America's surface water, Alaska is brimming with natural resources. After oil and gas, seafood is Alaska's largest export, a $5 billion industry, supported by generations of indigenous wisdom and modern innovation. So what we're doing right now is we're looking for jumpers. Every salmon has a unique jump. Puppies kind of flop, they go boom flop over once or twice. Coho salmon, what I call sky, they jump straight up out of the water. There's a jump right over there. Eric loves what he does. Jump in, baby! Every time he catches a fish, he's excited about it. Every time he figures out what the king salmon are biting on today, even if you know it's winter fishing and you might only catch five fish that day, Eric's excited about it, and he has such a deep appreciation for being able to be part of this way of life and a deep commitment to taking care of the ocean. Conserving is the first priority in Alaska. It's in our state constitution. If you cannot manage a fishery sustainably, you have to shut it down. And it's the only state in the country that has that. Sustainability isn't just about the fish, it's about jobs. Alaska is the biggest seafood source for the country. Every year, the ocean is naturally generating this food source. It doesn't take up any chemicals. It doesn't take up any land. It is a wonderful natural producer. In this country, we're moving more and more towards, you know, industrial scale. We work with farmers, we work with ranchers who are up against agribusiness versus the small farm. And it's the same with fishing, of having these small business be able to be successful in this increasingly industrialized world. This town wouldn't be Sitka without the fishing industry. And the fishing industry in Sitka might not be what it is today, if not for the Alaska Longline Fishermen's Association. Sometimes we say the Alaska Little Fisherwomen's Association, but that's kind of an inside secret. What's not a secret is how back in the 70s, Alpha launched a successful campaign to prevent foreign vessels from overfishing in Alaskan waters. And in the 90s, with Linda Benkin at the helm, they banned trawling in Southeast Alaska, a key victory considering one industrial trawling vessel could deplete fish stocks for an entire year. They established their own quota system for halibut to protect both the health of the fisheries and the communities that rely on them. Instead of, we want more fish today, we want more fish forever. 
commercial fishing along coastal Alaska is the economic backbone. In a lot of communities, it's the only economy. These coastal communities represent 60% of commercial fishing in the U.S. With over 60,000 jobs, that's nearly 10% of Alaska's population. And in Sitka, the heartbeat of the industry is the Seafood Producers Cooperative, owned 100% by local fishermen who share in 100% of the profits. We talk about how best can we help the economic health of our fishermen. How can we make sure that they're making money so they can do the maintenance on their boat and pay their crew well enough so they stick around. The fleet is getting smaller and aging. I think our work has been a big part of promoting how important it is to have people who see this as a way of life and want to pass on this fishing tradition to their children. They're raising the children on the boat. They are so committed to keeping the ocean healthy and sounding the alarm now about what's happening with climate change. There's a lot of concern about, I mean, I think all around the country, we're seeing fish stocks move north. Lobster may be moving out of Maine. I mean, that's huge for the fishermen that we work with up there. And same in Alaska. I mean, crab, salmon, halibut, our king crab, now our snow crab populations in the Bering Sea just crashed. I mean, over two years, they dropped 98%. That's the deadliest catch, but that, I mean, that's a huge industry for Alaska, for people who are based in Washington state that come up here and fish, you know, multi-million dollar loss. A big part of what it takes to be a good fisherman is to be recognizing patterns and recognizing when they change. In 2009, Alpha established the Fishery Conservation Network, a science-backed, community-driven initiative with a massive flagship undertaking they would map the ocean floor. We've got millions of data points now. So this is amazing technology, which uh, saves us from losing leads on the bottom floor, helps us minimize bycatch. There are times when a fishery might get shut down because of too much bycatch, and Alpha has made an active role in getting fishermen to reduce it on their own. Just want to create a new track for today because I don't want to be distracted about where the fish were yesterday. I just want to know where they are today. But I can have my depth and my speed over ground and my sea temperature all displayed here, plus my latitude and longitude. So that all helps us catch fish. So this is bathymetric mapping? <laughs> Bottom mapping is uh, how most people say it, or bathy. Bathy. Cool. Bathymetric. Bathymetric. That we went from a few years ago paper charts that had a sounding every two, three miles to collecting all of the data points from our group. And <gasps> each one of those, that those are the canyons off the Black Cod Edge. You can see the peaks and the valleys. That's incredible. Precisely. We have data from California all the way out to the edge of the Bering Sea. We've been building this as the technology has been uh, developing. The first set, we had so much data that it crashed the system. Yeah, take that supercomputer. <laughs> You're only mapping the entire ocean floor. Doing it on your own is pretty slow, but you know, getting all of the hundreds of effective years of fishing all together really makes it work. Bathymetric mapping shows fishermen what fish are swimming where which helps them avoid bycatch, the fish they don't want, while increasing the likelihood of a good, profitable catch. And it gives climate scientists a whole lot to consider. In fact, though Alpha's data is for members only, they share their data with NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, in a good faith effort to combat climate change. What first resonated with fishermen was concerns about ocean acidification before people were comfortable talking about climate change because it had gotten so political. Up here, we were observing a time when the ocean was so acidic that the shell-building creatures were not able to get calcium out of the water to keep building shells. And that includes these pteropods that are the primary prey species for pink salmon. Then as we've seen warming waters and rivers and streams get so hot in the summer, the salmon were dying before they could spawn. It drove the point home. And we're looking at uh, 
uh, converting this boat to diesel electric this summer. This little uh, Maritron things, it monitors all my fuel consumption when the hydraulics are on, when they're off, all these things so we can learn how to conserve fuel. We'd started working on that when we applied for the ETIP award. The U.S. Department of Energy's Energy Transitions Initiative Partnership Project, or ETIP for short, connects Alpha with the National Renewable Energy Labs and other organizations like the Renewable Energy Alaska Project. The application was open to communities, and my thinking was that Alpha is a community of fishermen, so we were the only non-government, um, non-municipality that was awarded. We've had this team now of top national scientists and engineers to help us identify what the gains would be from different boats making that conversion and what the best technology is to do that job. So first step was understanding fuel use. I've always been a cheapskate when it comes to fuel. This boat has two pickup truck engines and we don't burn much fuel. At the peak of the season this year, that would be $15,000 to fill it up. It went from being about 10% of your operating cost to close to 30%. It's prohibitive for a lot of fishing trips. Next step was, okay, what changes can you make to your operations or to the structure of your boat that would reduce your fuel consumption? And we've gone through and looked at the hydraulics and looked at the propellers and the whole speed of the boat. I know how much fuel it takes to run the refrigerator. The obvious next step is hybrid boat and eventually a transition to hydrogen or some renewable energy, maybe ammonia, as a way to power our boats with a zero carbon footprint. Our plan is to convert Eric's boat to a hybrid boat. So when my wife decided to retire and she'd been fishing with me for years and it was 65 and she'd battled seasickness for the whole career, decided to retire I was kind of despondent. And uh, my youngest son said, you love teaching and coaching, Dad. Take people, have them come out for a couple weeks, learn the rope. So I went to my friend, Linda Bank, and Linda really liked the idea, and she saw it as them becoming ambassadors for our industry. You now when I wake up and go to sleep thinking about how we grow out that expertise and that passion in the next generation. So in 2015, Alpha launched the crew training program as part of Alpha's Young Fisherman Initiative, with Eric Jordan leading the charge. His enthusiasm for working with young people and helping them explore this world of commercial fishing in a really safe environment has been just such a benefit to this community. It's just been enriching and inspiring to me to learn the stories of all these young people what makes them so adventuresome and brave that they're willing to come by themselves with this old fisherman out in the boat fishing in the Gulf of Alaska. But then they just get hooked. It's enriched my life and inspired me to keep fishing at 73 because I get to work with all these wonderful young people who want to see what this great fishing lifestyle is about. It's hard work and there's always been a lot of unknowns and it's high risk and now climate change. As fishermen, we have the seven steps of survival that we all know about. The first step is recognition. Some of us have recognized the changes. The second step is inventory. What are the resources we need to deal with this problem? And to deal with it, the change is already here and coming and then, in the long term, try to mitigate the damage for future generations. Because it's a matter of respect for Mother Earth and all these creatures that we share her with. It means that we're able to hand to the next generation of fishermen, to our kids, the same opportunities and the same healthy ocean that I found when I came up here 40 years ago, and that there's such abundance and such health and vigor that they would have those same opportunities to work as we did and bring their catch into a community like this. So here's something that a lot of us fishermen really believe. In your lifespan, a day fishing doesn't count against it. 
It's like soccer when you get extra time. A day fishing adds extra time to your life.